In chapter eight, we're going to learn about the central limit theorem. Now, the central limit theorem is going to come in two flavors for us. In 8.1, we're going to learn about the central limit theorem for means, and 8.2 is going to be the central limit theorem for proportions. But before we can get into all of that, we kind of need to take a step back and just think about what we're doing for a second. We want to be able to make the leap into inferential statistics. Now, remember, we learned in section 1.1 that inferential statistics, is, statistics means we are going to infer from a sample to the larger population. So we want to be able to make that leap. In other words, we want to be able to use statistics. In particular, we're interested in two of them. Well, the one for means would be x bar is the statistic because that's from a sample. That's the sample mean. And we want to be able to make guesses and arguments about the parameter that's associated with that, which would be mu. X bar and mu are not the same, but they should be close, right? So we want to be able to make that discussion happen. Right? And similarly, we want to make an argument about uh, p and p hat. p hat is a sample proportion. We'll learn about that in section 8.2. But it's the proportion for a sample. What percentage of a sample is this or that? And then the population value is p, right? population proportion. So those are the two that we're interested in, particularly in chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, actually. The, these two statistics and these two parameters that are associated with them. And if we're going to make that jump, if we're going to be able to learn how the statistics could possibly relate to the parameters and so on, we first need to understand a little bit more about how samples and their statistics, like um, mu and x bar, or, or excuse me, mu and p hat, but I'm still misspoke, X bar and P hat, there we go. So those statistics, X bar and P hat, how do they compare from sample to sample to sample? And so that's what we want to learn about first. It's called the sampling distribution. And we're going to see it through an example. So it's a little hard to get your mind around. So suppose you have a population, and we have that population drawn right here. And you can tell that's a skewed right population. So we can note its shape is skewed right. We learned about that way back in chapter two. When you have a tail over to the right, it's skewed right. All right, now we took samples from this population that are size two, 10, and 20. And we wanna note some things about what's happening. All right, first of all, let's look at the center. The center for all of, or excuse me, for the population is right here. It's at mu equals 8.08, .08, right? Now the center for this next one's right here. It's that line right there, and it's this line right here and this line right here. Now you might be wondering, wait a second, how come there are two little lines up here? See this little red one, and then a blue one, and down here it became just a blue one. Well, what's happening is that little red line right there is the median, whereas the little line on the right is the mean. Oh, sorry, it's the mu, which is 8.08. So that line right there is at the mu, but look, this next line is also at that same value. Hmm. And then so is this next line. And what's happening here is the median is less than the mean because it's skewed right. Remember that the mean gets pulled towards the tail. So that's why you're seeing a gap there. But down here, it's become symmetric enough that the mean and the median are right on top of each other. So there, aren't, there isn't a need for two lines. There aren't two lines down here. So that's the median, that's the mean, that's the median, that's the mean, and down here, the mean and median are the same spot. Now this little line right here is the mean of the x bars, right? So these are x bars, they're not the population. Now what do I mean by that? Okay, so look back at the population. Imagine you take, well let's start off with two. So we're gonna take two items or um, pieces from this <laughs> population, two um, individuals, there we go, two individuals from this population at random. So you just randomly pick two of them, find their x bar, and then plot it right here. Now take another two of them, find their x bar, and plot it here. Now take another two, find their x bar, and plot it here, and you do it over and over and over again. That would create this shape. So this is a graph of the x bars when n is equal to 2. That's what we're doing here. Down here, 
you imagine I take 10 at random, 10 random items from this, or 10 random individuals from this population and find their X bar, then do it again and find their X bar and do it again and find their X bar. And then I plot all those different X bars down here on this graph. So this is a graph of the X bars when N is equal to 10. And then lastly, <laughs> take 20. So imagine you take 20 items, 20 individuals at random from this population up here. Take 20, take their X bar, plot it. Take another 20, take their X bar and plot it. And so on and so on and so on. So you would graph all these different X bars when N is equal to 20. Now, there are some very important things going on here. What do we see happening to the shape, the center, and the spread? Well, let's start off with shape. Why not? <laughs> right? So shape. What do we see happening? Well, it started off skewed right. Right, That population skewed right. And if you look at this next one, it's also skewed right. I mean, you can see the mean is bigger than the median. Down here, maybe just a touch skewed right. I mean, it's pretty close to symmetric. And down here, it's even more symmetric. So what are we seeing? Right, if the population distribution is not normal, which it wouldn't, this was not, it was skewed right, then as long as n gets large enough, once n hits a certain threshold, then the distribution will be normal because this shape down here is pretty much normal, whereas these first two are not. n equals 10 is a little bit of a borderline. All right, so that's the first bit. If the population distribution I'm just going to abbreviate that pop dist, <laughs> right? If the population distribution is not normal, which this was not, it was skewed right, then um, the distribution of X bars, which is called the sampling distribution, actually. I can, I can actually put sampling distribution because what you're doing is taking a sample from the population and then plotting the X bar. So the sampling distribution of X bars will become normal if n is large enough. I'm going to put large enough in quotes. I'm also going to put it on the next line because <laughs> I want some space here. If n is large enough, n being the sample that you are taking, right, the size of the sample you are drawing. Now it's a little bit weird, large enough. What's large enough for us? Well, for us, we're going to have a rule of thumb that large enough for means, this is not true for section 8.2. Section 8.2 will have a different value. But for means, you want n to be larger than or equal to 30. If n is larger than or equal to 30, we will count it as normal. Now you can see that for our purposes, this is actually pretty normal right here um, at 20. That may be the case, but um, for our rule of thumb, we're going to go with 30. That will be the rule of thumb that we will have in our central limit theorem. Now, what about the center? The center is actually the easiest part. The center is the means of all these graphs. The mean of the X bars, the mean of these distributions, is equal to the mean, which was 8.08 .08 for all n regardless of how large n was or how small n was. The center is the same for all n. Right? Every single distribution has the same center at 8.08. .08. And you can see it because these little lines are vertically aligned. All right, so it's becoming normal. The center is the same. But there's another really important component to this, and that's the spread. Now you can see the spread, you can see the standard deviation in this little red bar right here. That's actually the give or take. See, it's adding on 6.22 and it's taking away 6.22 because 6.22 is the standard deviation here. And now if you look at the next graph down, that's the give or take. And you can see it's a little smaller than it is up here. So the, sta the spread is shrinking and then it shrinks even more and then it shrinks even more. So we're learning that if n increases, the standard deviation of that sampling distribution decreases. 
So we'll write that. So we have shape, we have spread, or center, now we have spread. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which has a name, it's called the standard error. It's that give or take that you see on these x-bar graphs. So it's called the standard error. In this case, it's of x-bar, right? It's the standard error of x-bar. It shrinks, right? It decreases as n increases. And as a matter of fact, there's a formula for it. The standard error of the x bar, which is known as sigma sub x bar, which is what we're graphing right here. When we graph this give or take, we're graphing standard error, right? The sigma sub x bar is sigma over the square root of n. That's the formula. Now, if you're thinking, oh no, uh, you know, another formula I have to write on my note sheet, uh, not so fast. First of all, we actually have all of this written out on your note sheet. It's right here in the section 8.1 decision matrix, which we'll get to later. But you can see right there, standard error of the x bar, which is sigma sub x bar, is sigma over the square root of n. And if we don't have sigma, then we approximate it with s over the square root of n. So it's right there on the note sheet, like that, first of all. And second of all, I want us to realize that we've just learned the important parts of the central limit theorem, right? We'll talk more about the conditions, but we saw, hey, if n is large enough, then the population distribution is normal, right? See how if it's large enough, n is greater than or equal to 30, then the distribution is normal. We just saw that. And then we saw the center was the same every time. So the center is just the mean of the sampling distribution, which is mu, which for our purposes in our example was 8.08. .08. And then the standard deviation is this little formula right here. Now let me prove to you that it shrinks, and then we'll be done with this particular portion and on to the next example. So let me find the standard error for all of these, just for fun. So you can see the mu point, or mu sub um, x bar is 8.08 .08 for all of them. So I could write in 8.08 .08 for every single one, no problem. They're all 8.08, .08. that's what this part says, right? That they're all 8.08 .08 for all n. All right, now what about the standard error, that standard deviation? How does it shrink? Let's see it. So I'm going to put it, I guess I'm going to have to put it over here real quick. So this one would be 6.22 divided by the square root of 2. Let's see what that is. Oh, and I have to give it a symbol. This is sigma sub x bar. And then sigma sub x bar. There, I just kind of added in that it spread and just rearranged a little bit. So sigma sub x bar is 6.22. It's sigma over the square root of n, and n changes for each of these three. So if I pull up my calculator, and you could also do this with Desmos, which either one makes you happy. So I could take 6.22, divide it by the square root of 2, and then I could do it again. 6.22 divided by the square root of, and I could go in here and change it to a 10, and then go do it again and change it to a 20. I got that square root um, by second square root. It's above your x squared one right there. And you can see that the top one has a give or take, and you, you can see it on the graph. It has a give or take of about 4.40 if I round because the 8 rounds the 9 up and the 9 rounds the 3, right? So that one's 4.40 for spread. This one is about 1.97 for spread, right? Just a little bit shy of 2. See, it's give or take 2 tick marks. You can see it right in there. And this one's about 1.39. As n is increasing, the standard error is decreasing. The standard deviation of these distributions is decreasing. And you can see it. Now, why is that happening, algebraically speaking? It's because n is in the denominator. Even though it's under a square root, that doesn't, it's not really relevant for our purposes. It's in the denominator. And so if it increases, then it's gonna cause the overall standard error to decrease. And the standard error is the sampling distribution's standard deviation. So it's the standard deviation of this picture. 
You can't call it standard deviation, however, because standard deviation is actually the spread for the original population. So it has its own name. It's the standard error, right? It's the give or take on the graphs of X bars rather than the graph of X's, which is what the original population is. Those are individuals. These are actually samples X bars. So it's the take a sample and plot the X bar. Take a sample, plot the X bar, and so on. And we've just seen the three main pieces of the central limit theorem played out, which is of course in a couple pages in the notes, but I'll run over them really quickly again. It becomes normal, right? The center is the same every time, right? It just is the center of the population. And the standard error has a formula. And because n is in the denominator of that formula, it means that as n gets larger, the standard error will get smaller, right? They have an inverse relationship to each other.